I shared in part one about child abuse and neglect. I want to share in part two about some of the things I discovered as an adult. Uh, let me just say, I'm not a parent, so I don't know how the responsibilities of a parent would be so that you know that I'm not going to try to school somebody on parenting. What I'm going to say is what I went through as a child was difficult. Um, there was very little money, and there were things that my parents did that I think led to why we were neglected the way we were. And I, I don't know, I do not believe it was on purpose. I definitely think that there was illness issues and addiction that contributed to it so that you know. When you listen to part one, you can obviously know that there's contributing factors to neglect and abuse. And neglect and abuse doesn't mean like somebody's hitting and physically assaulting someone. It's just, it's a use of something wrong over a long period of time. And I, I want to share a story that had happened to me. I believe I was about nine years old. My dad wanted to scare me and took me into a black neighborhood and brought me to this couple's apartment to show me the devastation of living in a neighborhood like that. And um, I was not aware how scary it really was because it was dilapidated and the conditions were pretty bad. Yeah, I mean, I would say it was so dilapidated that it made my house look like a clean house. <laughs> and I wanted to go home to talk to my mom. You know, I could remember thinking this way. And growing up and also going to college, um, there were things that happened when I was 21 that, you know, probably contributed to a lot of the problems I have. I had during that time when I was going to college, 21. And I was living at my dad's apartment. And again, you know, uh, it just goes, it, it continued. It wasn't like as if, it wasn't as bad, but it was bad. So there was no real fix cure to uh, the housekeeping that did not happen at home. My mom, same thing. I went to my mom's house and, you know, the conditions of the kitchen was dilapidated. So again, it just reaffirms that this was not just a one-time thing. This was going on for years. Um, I was emotional because I realized that a lot of people get in, caught up in cheating, lying, stealing, thievery, all kinds of things when you're in poor conditions, when your home is in poor conditions and when your situation is um, just desperate. And those are the kind of things that I want to address today. I want to address like what we do when we come to Christ, when we come to the Lord and no matter what your background is, a lot of people have come from backgrounds where they feel like they're, they turn to the wrong things. They turn to drugs. They turn to uh, stealing, cheating, lying. And then I, I've seen it firsthand. I just went through this about uh, not even a month ago where a girl had steal, stolen my last $40. And, you know, I had debated on whether to press charges because I realized that she's a mother of seven. But, I mean, that's, again, something I have to pray about. And I realized that there's a lot of people that do turn to stealing. The only way to stop it is to maybe get the authorities involved. I don't know the quick answer for this. So I don't try to pretend I know everything. I just talk to you the way I would talk to anybody. My health had deteriorated um, a couple years ago after dealing with my mother and the police. And I'm trying to share my story so that no one else has to pretend that this didn't happen and other people can also get help. Um, they, they're going to need to get help because... It is not going to continue. Uh, the best way to open up a problem is expose it with the light of Jesus Christ. And I, I know that I fear the Lord that 
if it were to continue, it would be uh, irresponsible and it would be, uh, it would be the same thing. It would be the same cycle of abuse. Um, neglect was the theme of the story for part one. Part two is just basically um, filling in what I think happened as an adult, you know. I know today how important it is to try to keep a house in order. It's very difficult. So I'm not sitting here chastising somebody for having difficulties. I'm not. I'm just saying that there are a lot of contributing factors that might lead someone down that road. And I've gone to college parties. I've gone to places where, you know, alcohol is involved and the conditions are off, obviously uh, unlivable and I wanted to go back to telling you again uh, why I'm sharing this. Um, when I was a little girl, and this might help those who didn't listen to part one. When I was a little girl, uh, my my mom and my dad were they were in alcohol and um, al I'm sorry, AA and Al-Anon, and their marriage was crumbling, and so was our home. And the authorities came in and basically removed us from the home. The conditions had gotten pretty bad and deteriorated. And we were deteriorating as a family, as, as individuals. So when the authorities got involved, the courts got involved, we were placed in foster home. And um, I think about the long-term effects of this um, uh, life I had to live and what I've gone through even today, how emotional it is to talk about this story because it's so real, you know, and my dad was homeless and there's a pattern that has played out in my own personal life about homelessness that I want to share. I was led through a lot of um, abuse and I was led into a lot of things, and I ended up with injuries, and I wasn't able to pay the rent. I wasn't able to do anything because the injuries were so bad, and I was having difficulties with everything. And it's taken a lot of prayer. It's taken a lot of research and homework and to get back to school, to get back to living the way I'm supposed to live. And I wanted to share this story because I hope that the breaking the cycle of poverty and abuse uh, doesn't just stop here. And I wanted to share why I know it's a cycle because it's played out in my life um, several times. And that's why I'm trying to reach out and uh, learn about the effects and, in, in, and the impact that poverty has on children uh, and domestic violence and the factors involved. I mean, it, going to a domestic violence shelter is not going to teach you the impact that it has. You can go right into the situation, see firsthand the filth, the dirt, the the problems that are exist. And when I say exist, it, 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 it there's a lot of reasons why um, to speak out and call the health department or talk to the authorities. Um, it doesn't have to continue. I see a lot of people, they see it, but they don't know what to do with it, okay? And the best way to do that is talk to the local health department and, the, and find out what they can do to help the situation. Um, usually they have a procedure and ways to help. Um, that was the case in my situation, um, and that's the case oftentimes, and in fact, all the time in every situation where there's uh, horrible, dilapidated conditions. Um, when I look at the improvements they make, I really want to share this. The people who work in counseling, who work with the victims or families that are having these type of problems, a lot of times you see the turnaround pretty significant, almost overnight you could tell that there are people that are willing to help and are not sitting there chastising the family or chastising the people involved. And that's the success story that we have to share in part three. But I know firsthand when we share the part three is because there are people that are willing to help.